Well, welcome to session 10. This is actually a bonus session, not actually a required part of our biblical interpretation course. But I thought I would offer this unit on the reliability of the Bible. Now, this particular session is really more appropriate for a, an apologetics course than one that's purely geared toward interpretation. But I got to thinking about this. If you're going to be an interpreter of the Word of God, then it's important for you to understand why you can trust the Word of God. Now, don't be scared by that word apologetics. You look that up in the dictionary, it will just say something like reasoned arguments or writings in defense of something, uh, in this case, in defense of the Bible. But our objective with this unit is simple. After this session, you should be able to identify the primary arguments used in favor of the Bible's historical reliability. Now, following that, uh, then your personal goal should be the ability to discuss these arguments conversationally. Let me pose this question to you. In decades past, when evangelist Billy Graham would begin a truth claim with the statement, the Bible says, uh, most people accepted it as such, as a truth claim. Now, the question is, would most people accept it today in our current society? Why or why not? Now, my personal thinking is, you know, given our society's increasing hostility toward Christianity, my guess is that fewer and fewer people would accept the truth claims of Christianity based solely on our claims that the Bible says so. Something to think about. Now here's something else. If someone who is skeptical of the Bible's truth claims, you know, an, an agnostic, atheist, that type person, if they ask you why you believe the Bible is true, in what manner would you answer them? Well, with that thought in mind, let me direct your attention to 1 Peter 3.15. Here the Apostle Peter writes, In your hearts, Honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. Uh, the point being that sometimes how we say something is just as important as what we actually say. So let me, let me start off with this question. Where did the Bible come from? Who authored it? Now, if you've, in, uh, if you've completed my biblical interpretation course, obviously you already know the answers to that question, where it came from and, and who authored it. But the Bible is an extraordinary work of literature, and it makes some astonishing claims. The Bible records the details of the creation of the universe, the origin of life, the moral law of God, the history of man's rebellion against God, and the historical details of God's work of redemption for all who trust in His Son, Jesus Christ. The Bible also claims to be God's revelation to mankind. Now, if this is true, well, then this has implications for all aspects of life. How we should live, why we exist, what happens when we die, and what our meaning and purpose is here in this life. But how do we know if the claims of the Bible are true? How can we defend the claims of Christianity to non-believers if we don't have assurance of the Bible's trustworthiness? Well, in this session, we're going to cover some of the objective arguments used in defense of the Scripture's reliability. There are, of course, subjective arguments for the Scripture's truth. The most powerful, of course, is your own testimony and how the Scripture has the power to change your own life. But what if, for the skeptic, your own personal experience doesn't provide enough evidence for him or her to trust the Bible's claims? Well, that's where you turn to the objective evidence for the Bible's trustworthiness. So let's talk about those ob objective proofs, the objective arguments for the, the reliability, rather, of Scripture. Now, the first one of those 
objective arguments is going to be what we call the internal evidence. The internal claims that the Bible makes of inspiration, of inerrancy, infallibility. You see, Christians claim that the Bible is the inspired Word of God. That word inspired means God breathed. The words of the Bible are God's words. Now, let me pose this question. Is it possible that only parts of the Bible are inspired? Can we take any part of it and, and ignore or dismiss it, uh, dismiss it rather, and adopt the rest of the Bible as being inspired? <laughs> well, I jokingly like to call this idea that only certain spots of the Bible are inspired uh, Dalmatian inspiration. Uh, actually, the term we want to focus on here is verbal plenary. Verbal plenary is the term that Bible scholars actually use, meaning that each and every word contained in the Bible is inspired. Every word of the Bible, inspired by God. Uh, most Christians also claim that the Bible is inerrant or infallible. Now, it's, it's noteworthy that these two terms, inerrancy and infallibility, are generally used interchangeably, though there are some subtle differences between how the infallibility and the inerrancy of Scripture are defined. The word infallible actually means incapable of mistakes. If something is infallible, it is never wrong and thus absolutely trustworthy. Now, similarly, the word inerrant, also applied to Scripture, means free from error. Now, the difference between these two would actually make a really great topic for your own personal research. And a good starting place might be the Chicago Statement on Biblical Inerrancy, the CSBI, and that's available online. Uh, for those of you who, like me, are Baptist, perhaps a comparison of the statements on Scripture from both the 1963 and the 2000 versions of the Baptist Faith and Message might be in order as well. Now, there are some subtle differences in wording between the two on this matter, uh, and it's also available online. But for purposes of our discussion today, we're not going to go uh, into this any further in any further detail on this particular topic. But uh, getting back to the inspiration of Scripture, there's a couple of passages we want to read together. 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, and also 2 Peter 1, 21. Now, 2 P Timothy 3, 16 and 17, you're familiar with this passage, most likely. That's where Paul, writing to Timothy, says that all Scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. And then, of course, 2 Peter 1.21, Peter says that no prophecy ever came by the will of man. Instead, men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Now, it is relevant to our discussion in this unit that the Bible itself actually claims to be the inspired Word of God, spoken by God to men. And since it claims to be God's Word, one could also argue that it also claims to be without error. Consider what the Scriptures say of themselves. And the words of the Lord are flawless, like silver refined in a furnace of clay, purified seven times, uh, Psalm 12, 6. Or consider Psalm 19, 7. The law of the Lord is perfect. Uh, Proverbs 30, verse 5. That every word of God is pure. 2 Peter 1, 19. We also have the prophetic word strongly confirmed. Psalm 119, 160 says, the entirety of your word is truth. Each of your righteous judgments endures forever. So here's another question for you to ponder, and I want you to think carefully about this. Does the Bible contain the word of God? Hmm. 
Well, the phrasing of that question is a little tricky. You see, if the Bible simply contains the Word of God, well, some could claim that some of what it contains is not actually the Word of God. Now, those some who claim to revere the scriptures might actually try to tell you otherwise. The Bible doesn't simply contain the Word of God. The Bible is the Word of God, all of it. Remember that term we discussed earlier, verbal plenary, every word. And the Bible does claim that all of its assertions are true and useful for teachings. Such statements do prove, at the very least, that the writers of the Bible considered it to be not merely their own opinion, but in fact the inspired, infallible Word of God. Now, there's an argument for the infallibility or the inerrancy of the Bible that I want to share with you, and it's pretty simple, actually. The, the axiom goes like this. Part A, God is perfect and cannot err. Part B, the Bible is God's Word. Part C, therefore the Bible, which is the Word of God, cannot err. God is perfect and cannot err. The Bible is God's Word, therefore the Bible cannot err. That's the axiom. Now let me expound on that just a little bit. The Bible does clearly claim to be the Word of God. It is said in 2 Timothy 3.16 and Matthew 4.4 4, to be God-breathed. It is said in Matthew 5.17 uh, and 18 and also 15.3-6 to have divine authority. In Romans 9.6 and Hebrews 4.12, it is called God's Word and the Word of God. And in Genesis 12, 1 through 3, Exodus 9, 16, Romans 9, 17, Galatians 3, 8, it claims to speak the words of God. Now, that's not an exhaustive lift, a, a list of scripture references. That's just a few. Now, for the sake of brevity, let me just assume that you accept God as the perfect standard of right and wrong, good and bad. Well, God, as that perfect standard of goodness and truth, cannot have any evil or falsehood in his being. He, as the perfect standard of truth, cannot speak something he knows to be false. And because God is all-knowing, omniscient, well, then it follows that whatever he says has always been and will always be true. That is, God cannot err. He cannot commit error. So because the Bible is the Word of God, and because it is impossible, rather, for God to err, well, then it logically follows that the Bible cannot be in error and is therefore trustworthy. Now, a skeptic is going to ask you, well, how do you know the Bible is perfect? And most believers are going to respond, well, because it's God's Word and He's perfect. To which the skeptic is going to say, well, how do you know that God is perfect? And the most common response would be, well, because the Bible tells me so. Which actually brings us back to the original question. Now, what do we call this type of reasoning? Well, it's called circular logic or circular reasoning. And can this argument alone be enough to convince a skeptic of the Bible's trustworthiness? Well, not likely. I mean, arguing that the Bible must be true solely on the basis that it says so, that's not a particularly powerful argument with a skeptic. Yes, it is a relevant argument, and it's a true claim. But we're going to need some additional information if we're going to avoid the vicious cycle of circular reasoning. So, in addition to the Bible's claims uh, of itself, there is also another type of, uh, of evidence, the internal textual unity or the internal consistency of the Bible. Yes, we, we think of the Bible as one book, but it's not simply one book, but a library of 66 books with two divisions. We call them testaments or, or covenants. And the 39 books of the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, were written over a 1,500-year period of history before the birth of Jesus Christ. 
They were written primarily in Hebrew with a few portions in Aramaic. And then the 27 books of the New Covenant, the New Testament, were written between roughly 50 and 100 AD, probably more specifically between 48 and 96 AD, the latter half of the first century. But that's within 70 years of Christ's death and resurrection. And these books were written in Greek. Now, other religious books have a single author, but the Bible has 40 different human authors, farmers, peasants, physicians, tax collectors, sheep herders, all sorts of men. But remember what 2 Peter 1-2 said, no prophecy ever came by the will of man. Instead, men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And this is probably the one, uh, certainly the most major commonality for the Bible's authors, and that's the Spirit's inspiration. They were all inspired by the same Holy Spirit to write. Not only were there some incredibly diverse authors, but these authors also lived in incredibly diverse times. Uh, Job and the books written by Moses have no exact date, but they're estimated to have been written 12 to 1500 years before Christ. Uh, the latest books were written before 100 AD, and these covered a broad cross-section of history, of cultures, situations, and governments. Now, the Bible was also written on three different continents, Europe, Asia, and Africa, and were written from the desert, written from prison, from the countryside, from royal courts, and from exile. Now, you might think that with that much diversity, there would be no harmony or unity in the Bible. Yet, as we discussed, the Bible claims of itself that all Scripture is inspired by God. So as believers, you and I know that the Holy Spirit is the, the glue that gives the Bible unity in spite of the diversity of the authors, of the times, the genres, the Bible does have unity. The Bible is remarkably self-consistent, despite having been written by 40 different writers over a time span of roughly two millennia. That is, if you include the intertestament period in that time frame. The themes of God's moral law, man's rebellion against God's law, God's plan of salvation, those are continuing themes that run throughout the pages of Scripture. Now, we discovered this in our unit on biblical narrative. Well, this internal consistency is just exactly what we would expect if the Bible really is what it claims to be, God's revelation to mankind. James Orr, who was a late 19th century, early 20th century theologian, once stated, the Bible is a single book because it embodies such a revelation and exhibits such a purpose. The unity of the book, made up of so many parts, is the attestation of the revelation it contains. In other words, a unity that is humanly impossible is divinely actual. So, according to the internal evidence, the Bible claims to be God's Word, and it contains remarkable internal consistency. But, is that enough to convince the skeptic? Well, if not, then we move from the internal evidence to the external evidence. A lot of Christians have argued for the truth of Scripture on the basis of various lines, various lines of external evidence. For example, the first category, archaeological discoveries. Archaeological discoveries have confirmed many events of the Bible. Uh, for example, in 1990, the excavation of Jericho revealed evidence suggesting that the walls of this city did fall as described in the book of Joshua though some still claim that there's not enough evidence to confirm this, and as such, the Bible is historically inaccurate. But in fact, numerous passages of the Bible, which critics once claimed were merely myth, have now been confirmed archaeologically. Uh, for example, 
the five cities of the plain described in Genesis 14.2. These were once thought by secular scholars to be mythical, but ancient documents have been found that list these cities as part of ancient trade routes. Hundreds of thousands of archaeological artifacts and more discoveries all the time have proven biblical accounts occurred as recorded. Uh, some other examples, the uh, skeptics have denied the fact of the lion's den from the book of Daniel, yet it was discovered. In the 19th century, there was no record of the Hittite nation, much to the delight of the critics. However, we now have evidence of its existence, including the king's throne, which now rests in a museum. More recently, uh, skeptics have come to claim there is no such thing as the Davidic kingdom, that David was a myth, but in 1993, archaeological studies at Dan revealed the proof. J. O. Kinnaman, uh, an outstanding archaeologist who found evidence to corroborate the historical account of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, once said this, Of the hundreds of thousands of artifacts found by the archaeologists, not one has ever been discovered that contradicts or denies one word, phrase, clause, or sentence of the Bible, but always confirms and verifies the facts of the Bible record. So not only does archaeology not disprove Scripture, it certainly confirms much of it. Yet, at the same time, it alone does not prove the Bible is entirely true, does it? I mean, after all, not every claim in Scripture has been confirmed archaeologically yet. Uh, the Garden of Eden has never been found. Noah's Ark, uh, some think they know where it is, but it's never actually been found. Um, so there's, there's still some questions there. Uh, let me add this before we uh, close out on the archaeological uh, topic. If you're interested in further research in this area, there's a couple of great online resources that you can consult. One is biblicalarchaeology.org, biblicalarchaeology.org, and the second one is bibleartifacts.com. Now, artifacts is spelled F-A-X instead of F-A-C-T-S, bibleartifacts.com. So let me pose this question. Is it a reasonable statement to say that archaeology is useful? Well, yeah, definitely. But is it completely infallible? Well, yes, archaeology is certainly useful, but yeah, it's still fallible at the same time. So we have to ask ourselves, can a fallible procedure judge what claims to be the infallible Word of God? Not entirely. I mean, using the less certain to judge the more certain, that seems logically flawed. Yes, archaeology can show consistency with Scripture since it shows that some of the Scripture is true, but it alone is not in a position to prove the whole Bible in any definitive way. So, let's <clears throat> dig up more evidence on the Bible's reliability. Yes, the pun was intended. In addition to archaeological discoveries, another form of external evidence for the Bible would be uh, secular historians. When I say secular historians, I mean extra-biblical writings. Extra-biblical writings have confirmed some of what is told in the Gospels. For example, uh, Flavius Josephus was an unbiased historian Certainly not sympathetic to Jesus, but he was considered to be a reliable historian. And in his writings, he confirms that A, Jesus was the martyred leader of the church in Jerusalem, and that B, he was a wise teacher who, C, had established a wide-lasting following despite the fact that Pilate had him crucified. And if you want to read that for yourself, you can see Josephus' work called The, uh, the Antiquities of the Jews. There's also a Roman historian and Senator Tacitus who corroborated some of the general facts of Christ's life in his final work called Annals. There are a number of other pagan Greek writers who were quite hostile to Christianity. 
And in an attempt to explain away the supernatural nature of Jesus' life, inadvertently gave historical corroboration of it. And there's other extra biblical writers, including Thallus, uh, Pliny the Younger, or Pliny, if you prefer that pronunciation, also Suetonius and others. Now we're going to take a quick break to hear from Dr. Timothy Jones as he expounds on the extra biblical proof for Jesus' life. And then we'll come right back. So what historical proof is there for Jesus? Well, we have to recognize that one of the things people say sometimes in, in attacking the gospel is that they say, you know what, there's not any references to Jesus or very few in the Roman historians or anything like that. Therefore, he must not have existed or he wasn't who the New Testament says he was because surely he would have been mentioned. Well, part of the problem when people say that is simply that they are assuming a written culture. We live in a written culture. If something happens to us today, it goes on the internet in written form or it goes in a newspaper in written form in a very short time period, but the people then were an oral culture. They passed things on for a long time by word of mouth and would memorize things to pass them on word of mouth, generation to generation even. But even beyond that, we have to recognize the other part of it is that that's an argument from silence. The fact is, we don't know what records may have been written about Jesus because, for example, in Jerusalem, all the records that were there were burned in the year 70 AD when the Romans destroyed the city. So there could could have been records of Jesus there at that time. We just don't know about it. So what records are there, historical records about Jesus? Well, there aren't any from around the time that he was living on the earth uh, that are Roman records, for example. In fact, the only Roman history that was written at that time was by a, a retired general named Velius Paterculus. Why would he have mentioned a, a Galilean teacher? He simply wouldn't have done that. Uh, the first references we do have to Jesus come from the late first and early second centuries. But that's about what we would expect because the time that the Romans would write about this is when the Christian movement became big enough to have some effect on the peace of Rome. And so you find, for example, Suetonius uh, mentioning Jesus, mentioning that Jews were causing disturbances because of a certain crestus is the way he expresses it. We find Tacitus, the Roman historian Tacitus, who says that Christ suffered the extreme penalty and he even mentions, Tacitus does, Pontius Pilate. It's very likely Tacitus was at that point drawing from some official record that he had access to that we don't because he even mentions the governor at that time. We find uh, the, the author Pliny writes to Trajan, Emperor Trajan, and describes the fact that uh, Christians pray to Christ as to a God. And so in all of these, we find about the time we ought to expect it, Jesus being mentioned in Roman records. Additionally, he's mentioned by the Jewish writer Josephus. Unfortunately, that reference in Josephus has been miscopied and added to over the years. So we don't know what he originally said about Jesus but we do know he at least mentioned Jesus. And so in all of these and precisely the sources we would expect at the time you ought to expect in a culture that passed things on orally uh, from generation to generation, we find references to Jesus. And we do find these references not only in the Gospels, not only in Christian sources, but also in Roman sources. So far, we've seen that external evidence includes archaeological evidence and extra-biblical writings, but it also includes a third category, bibliographical uniqueness. What do I mean by that? Well, there are far, far more copies of the biblical manuscripts with remarkable consistency between them than there are for any of the classics like Plato or Aristotle, Socrates. F.F. F. Bruce, author of the, uh, the book, The New Testament Documents, Are They Reliable?, said there is no body of ancient literature in the world which enjoys such a wealth of good textual attestation as the New Testament. Of the New Testament alone, we actually have about 5,800 complete or fragmented Greek manuscripts compared to only seven copies of works by Plato, which are dated 1,200 years after he originally wrote. It's actually estimated that there are now over 19,000 copies of the New Testament in the Syriac, the Latin, 
Coptic and Aramaic languages, and that the total supporting New Testament manuscript base is over 24,000 manuscript fragments. Now, some would argue that the manuscripts discovered later would not carry as much credibility. But when you understand the painstaking efforts that Bible scribes take to accurately copy the scriptures, the consistency between manuscripts tells a much more amazing story. The Bible is uniquely authentic among ancient literary works in terms of the number of ancient manuscripts found and the shortness of the time scale between when the work was first written and the date of the oldest existing manuscript. What does this mean? Well, it means that the possibility of alteration from the original and, and the introduction of legendary material is minimal. Now, what this tells us is that the Bible has been accurately transmitted, transmitted rather, uh, throughout the ages, far more so than any ancient documents. Uh, ironically, few people would doubt that Plato really wrote the works that are ascribed to him, and yet the Bible is far, far more authenticated. The textual criticism by experts shows at the very least that the Bible is, first of all, unique in ancient literature, that it has been accurately transmitted throughout the ages. And so what we have today is an exceptional representation of the original. In fact, the purity of the existing modern day Bible texts is estimated at 99.5%. That is once the copyist errors, none of which affect any doctrine in the Bible, are accounted for. No one could consistently argue that the Bible's authenticity is in doubt unless he's willing to doubt all the other works of antiquity because they, you know, Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, etc., are far less substantiated. Of course, this is exactly what we would expect given our premise that the Bible is true. Now, let me just offer a quick side note. When it comes to the topic of manuscript evidence, uh, I'm really just barely scratching the surface here. For a most excellent and, and much more comprehensive look at the bibliographical evidence and at textual criticisms, proofs for the Bible's reliability, I highly recommend a documentary by Dr. Craig Evans called Fragments of Truth. Now, Fragments of Truth can be streamed online at faithlife.com, or you can also purchase the DVD through faithlife.com as well. But let me, let me pose this question. Would the bibliographical evidence alone be enough to prove the Bible's reliability? Well, it's certainly a good start. But while uniqueness and authenticity to the original texts means that the Bible is unique, and has been accurately transmitted. And while this is consistent with the Bible's own claim that it is the Word of God, it alone doesn't decisively prove that the, the, the claim that the Bible is true. All right, so, so far we've seen that the external evidence includes archaeological evidence, extra-biblical writings, and bibliographical uniqueness. But we can also add to that a fourth category, that of predictive prophecy and divine insight. Let's talk for a sec about prophecy. A number of passages in the Bible predict future events in great detail, events that were future to the writers but are now an hour past. For example, Daniel chapter 2, a prophecy that predicted the next three world empires up to and including the Roman Empire and the fall of those empires. What was predictive prophecy for Daniel well, that's now a matter of recorded history for us. Now, if the Bible were not inspired by God, how could its mere human writers possibly have known about events in the distant future? The Bible contains an astounding number of fulfilled prophecies. In fact, roughly one-third of the Bible is prophecy. Now, though as interpreters, we must be very careful to distinguish between 
predictive prophecy and pronouncement prophecy. And that's something that we talked about uh, more specifically in our unit on interpreting the prophets. But the Bible contains over 1,800 prophecies concerning more than 700 different subjects found in over 8,300 verses. Uh, the Old Testament contains more than 300 prophecies concerning Jesus Christ alone, many with amazing specificity. Numerous prophecies were fulfilled in the person of Christ, coming to pass precisely as foretold. And the mathematical odds of someone making this number of predictions and having every one of them come to pass are light years beyond the realm of human possibility. Uh, let me give you a few examples. For example, how did Micah know where the Christ was to be born? How does Daniel specify the very year Jesus would be crucified? You can see that in Daniel 9, 24 through 27. Jeremiah predicted that his people would be taken into 70 years of Babylonian captivity, and they were. Ezekiel 26 also predicted the destruction of Tyre, saying that its rocks would be scraped. Well, guess what? Nebuchadnezzar destroyed it, and its rocks were scraped 300 years later by Alexander the Great. He scraped Tyre's ruins into the sea, fulfilling Ezekiel's prophecy. And Jesus Christ predicted the fall of Jerusalem. That's in Matthew 24, 2. <coughs> It was destroyed in 70 A.D. And Jesus told his followers that when this time came, they should flee. And the historian we mentioned earlier, Josephus, he actually confirms that Jesus' believers did in fact flee, but unbelievers did not. So, fulfilled prophecy helps confirm the Bible's reliability. But in addition to fulfilled prophecy, there's also the matter of divine foreknowledge. Just to touch on this very briefly, the Bible also touches on matters of science in ways that seem to go beyond what was known to humankind at that particular time. For example, Isaiah 40, 22, we read about the expansion of the universe. It specifically states the spreading out of the heavens. Yet secular scientists did not discover that the universe was in a state of expansion until the 1920s. In spite of the fact that Bible-believing Christians are still mocked today as flat earthers, uh, the spherical nature of the earth and the fact that the earth hangs in space are suggested in scriptures such as Job 26.7, then a few verses later, Job 26.10 respectively. Yet the book of Job is thought to have been written around 2000 B.C., long before the nature of our planet was generally known. Such evidence is certainly consistent with the claim that the Bible is inspired by God. And the evidence is pretty compelling. But as with archaeology, do we use an inexact science as a standard to measure the authenticity of the Bible? Well, you know, what constitutes a scientific fact in today's world is often subject to the interpreter's bias and to the the paradigm through which the, the data is viewed. So again, how can we judge what claims to be inerrant revelation by a standard that itself is uncertain and ever-changing? In other words, errant. While these evidences show us consistency in the Scripture, using the less certain to make a definitive statement about the more certain still doesn't entirely make our case, does it? So, if you used any single one of these objective cases as an argument for the Bible's reliability, would it convince most skeptics? Uh, maybe, maybe not. But what might be the result if we took all of these arguments together? Well, while any one individual proof might not make a definitive argument for the truth of the Bible in the mind of the skeptic, if you put them all together, you can make an incredibly strong case, a case of the whole being greater than the sum of its parts. 
the truth of the Bible is actually obvious to anyone willing to investigate it fairly and comprehensively. The Bible is uniquely self-consistent and extraordinarily authentic. It has changed the lives of millions of people who have placed their faith in Christ. Now, of course, that is a subjective proof, but a proof nonetheless. It's been confirmed countless times by archaeology and other sciences. It possesses divine insight into the nature of the universe and has made correct predictions about the distant future, events that have been predicted with perfect accuracy. So, when Christians read the Bible, they can't help but recognize the voice of their Creator. The Bible claims to be the Word of God, and it demonstrates this claim by making knowledge possible. It is the standard of truth. Now, let me just add an important note. As Christians, we have to be very careful not to eliminate the Holy Spirit from our, uh, our apologetic equation, so to speak. While we might not expect our arguments to make great headway into overcoming skepticism, the Spirit can take the seeds that we plant to cultivate truth in the agnostic heart. But we must also remember 1 Peter 3.15. Yes, we are to always be ready to give an answer to anyone who asks the reason for the hope that's within us, but we present our defense, as Peter says, with gentleness and respect. Now, let me give you something to ponder as we close up this uh, session. What sorts of objections to the Bible's truth claims have you heard? Well, to help these arguments that we've covered better gel in your mind, I would encourage you to sit down and to write your answer to those objections that you've heard, utilizing the information that we've covered in this session today. It might even be more helpful to, to think of a friend who's an agnostic, someone who's skeptical of the Bible's claims, and to write your response to their skepticism, their objections, in the form of a personal letter to him or her. And this will help you to articulate your thoughts a lot better. Now, there is some at-home work that I want you to do as we close out this final session together. I want you to watch video segment number one, What's so special about the Bible? And video segment number three, How We Got the New Testament, both from the How We Got the Bible series with Dr. Timothy Jones. And the web links will be in your class instructions. Now, since you've been assigned so much video to watch in this particular unit, you'll be pleased to know there is no assigned reading for this session. But I do want to recommend some outside reading just for your own personal enlightenment. I'd encourage you to try the uh, book, Why Should I Trust the Bible, also by Dr. Timothy Jones, uh, specifically chapter number five, How Much of the Bible Must I Trust? Uh, this book is a clear and simple treatment of the matter of the Bible's reliability. Now, you can get the paperback online for only $10 at christianbook.com, or if you uh, prefer e-books, the Kindle version is available from Amazon for only $8. Well, we've just scratched the surface of this topic of the Bible's reliability. So if you want to do an exhaustive study of the inspiration, the infallibility, and the sufficiency of the Bible, there are several theology texts that I can uh, recommend that provide uh, comprehensive information. Now, if you want to contact me, I'd be happy to give you the suggestions of several books that you can take up and read on your own. But that wraps up our study together. I hope that this series has not only blessed you and challenged you, but has also equipped you in a better understanding of the Bible to make you one who fully embodies the truth of 1 Timothy 2.15, where Paul says, Be diligent to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who doesn't need to be ashamed correctly teaching the word of truth.